In 2015 alone, 429,000 people around the world died of malaria. And 212 million people had this disease. 212 million. That's more than three times the entire population of France. Now, take a moment to think of the hundreds of thousands of others who died that same year from a number of other infectious diseases. Tuberculosis, dengue, HIV, just to name a few. Unfortunately, 98% of these deaths occurred in the South Asian and African regions, particularly in developing economies where access to critical care is severely limited. On one hand, healthcare today is the greatest that it's ever been in the history of the world, and that's solely due to advances in science and technology. But on the other, there remains a dire need to translate these medical advances to underserved regions of the globe and distribu distribute them at a large scale. For the past four years, I've been playing my small part to contribute in the efforts to solve this global problem. My name is Neil Davey, and I'm a fourth year undergraduate at Harvard University, studying applied mathematics and economics, with the secondary in global health and health policy. For the past four years, I've been working in the laboratory of Professor David Waits at Harvard University on drop-based microfluidics platforms for the early diagnosis of a variety of diseases. My story begins in the summer of 2012. I entered the Waits lab as just a third year high school student, and I was working on a drop-based platform to detect cancers at a very early stage. Traditionally, cancers are diagnosed via something known as a tumor biopsy. The doctor takes a needle and literally pokes the site of the tumor. This is dangerous, quite invasive, and oftentimes downright inaccurate. In particular, it requires that a tumor exists for the biopsy to occur. So oftentimes, the diagnosis is at a quite a late stage. The holy grail of cancer diagnosis is therefore a liquid biopsy, wherein cancer cells are detected directly from the bloodstream. Not only is this safer than a tumor biopsy, but it allows for cancers to be diagnosed at a far earlier stage, before tumor formation even begins. Now, what exactly is drop-based microfluidics? And why does it allow for such a liquid biopsy to diagnose cancers at such an early stage? <clears throat> at its core, the technology allows for the encapsulations of blood cells, be it healthy cells or circulating tumor cells, in the case of cancer patients, into water and oil emulsions known as microfluidic drops. A DNA amplification technology allows for only the genes of the cancer cells to be amplified. What this means is that only the drops containing the cancer cells will have amplification, and this will lead to a subsequent fluorescent signal. So only the drops that contain these cells will have a signal, and this fluorescence can be detected and quantified via laser. The technology doesn't only give a yes-no output indicating the presence of the disease, but rather gives a quantitative output, telling the doctor how many cancer cells there are per volume of blood, and thereby indicating the stage of the patient's cancer. Why is this unique? In traditional molecular diagnosis, say there's one cancer cell and 10,000 healthy blood cells the overwhelming presence of those cells make it impossible to detect that one cancer cell. That makes it seem like the patient is doing perfectly fine. Drop-based microfluidics, on the other hand, allows for each cell to be in its own discrete reaction vesicle, allowing us to distinguish between the cancer cells and the healthy cells, preventing the masking of the bad cells by the good. In particular, our technology is so ultra-sensitive that it can detect as little as one cancer cell out of 10 billion healthy blood cells. And imagine that, one billion cells. Each of these drops is exceedingly small, having the same thickness as just a strand of human hair. 
This is the biomedical equivalent of finding a needle in a haystack. Further, the technology allows for individual cancer genomes to be stored within the microfluidic drops. This gives individual patient information to the doctor and allows for therapies to be tailored towards that particular patient. For example, if a drop contains a genome, it can be DNA sequenced. And if that sequence reveals certain specific mutations for a patient, doctors can have personalized treatment for those mutations. This overcomes the huge problem of patient variation that exists today in oncology. Now to speak of this technology without acknowledging the group effort that was involved in its creation would be unfair. During my time in the lab, not only did I learn the importance of the scientific method, but I learned the power of collaboration and the importance of working in a team, which drastically ex improved my experiences there. By being unafraid to ask questions, reaching out for help from, help from those who are older than me, and sharing my results with colleagues, I was able to get a lot done during my summer there. My mentor and I particularly worked hand in hand with doctors at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And they successfully tested our cancer platform on prostate cancer patients in the hospital. Interestingly, the platform can be adapted for any disease, so long as the DNA fragments being amplified and targeted are specific to that disease. But despite being a drastic improvement in terms of detecting cancers at a far earlier stage and doing so non-invasively, this was still a rich man's technology. It required large pumps to generate the microfluidic emulsions, time-consuming DNA amplification machines, and very, very expensive fluorescence microscopes to actually image the drops. Such a technology could never be used in many of the developing countries of our world today. So, since the essence of the platform is so flexible, I envisioned using the same technique for a number of other diseases, infectious diseases, like tuberculosis and malaria, which are pretty uncommon in the developed world, but still severely debilitating in a number of developing countries. Form our team to actually translate this technology from something that's high cost to something that's low cost, it was important for us to make serious design changes to our device. The first thing we did was, instead of using large pumps to generate these microfluidic drops, we just used a simple handheld pipette, a device that exists in almost every lab around the world. Also, I thought up the idea of using isothermal DNA amplification. That basically means amplifying the DNA at a single temperature of 35 degrees centigrade so the device is functional just in the heat of the sun. It also shortens the amplification time from three hours to just one. And rapid diagnosis is extremely important in the field because knowing your disease status right away is highly correlated with your treatment outcomes. Finally, we're working on a simple mobile phone camera with an attached LED and lens, which can be used to actually image the drops. Overall, this technology would circumvent the need for a laboratory. We wouldn't need any electricity, and it can be scaled up at a much grander level in the developing world. After creating this point of care technology, I applied for a grant from the Deutsche Bank to fund pilot stage clinical tests in malaria endemic regions of the world. Fortunately, we won a $20,000 grant to take this device to the Peruvian Amazon this past January and test it on malaria patients that were there. Malaria is a especially problematic disease because although an effective treatment strategy exists, because of poor diagnosis, a number of people have serious health complications. Also, there's many, many asymptomatic cases, which leads to the unknowing spread of this disease. So the point of our being in Peru was to test our inexpensive device and see if we could quantitatively and rapidly detect malaria parasites from the bloodstream of these patients. We first arrived in Lima, where we met our Peruvian teammates and worked in the university lab for a few days. Then, device in hand, we went to the Amazonian city 
of Manakamiri. <clears throat> and with it, and Manakamiri was in a larger region known as Iquitos. Iquitos was beautiful. As you can see from this image, the greenery and tranquil of the rainforest are stunning, and they mask the underlying health problems that exist in the Amazon rainforest. While there, as I mentioned, we went to the village of Manakamiri. Manakamiri has an unusually high rate of malaria. The patients there, when we went to the village, were so happy to see us, trying to diagnose their conditions. In Manakamiri, we drew blood samples from the patients and tested them in our device. Fortunately, we found that those who were positive with malaria or who had the disease were able to be distinguished from those who were disease-free after using our device. This was extremely exciting news and showed us that our technology was at least as good as the standard of care, which is a lab-based microscopy test that currently exists. But we don't want to be just as good. We want to show that our technology is actually better than the existing technology. For one, the lab-based test performs poorly in the field. Community health workers have a difficult time actually quantifying how much malaria a patient has. And also, it's difficult for them to distinguish between different malaria parasite species that exist. These are both problems that our technology solves quite easily. The most amazing part of being in Manakamiri was speaking with the villagers there about their health conditions, learning about their malaria. They were so open to us foreigners and welcomed us with open arms into their homes. Imagine this for a second. A group of four university students knocking on your door, syringe in hand, asking if they could draw your blood for a malaria trial they were conducting. The faith that these villagers had in us is truly awe-inspiring and motivates me every day to make sure that this technology works well and reaches corners of the world like Manakamiri. We learned especially a lot about these villagers' conditions through a survey we conducted on malaria control. Despite a severe number of cases in the past, and even a few deaths, these villagers were surprisingly optimistic about their situations. They told us that the health outpost there was robust. It did a good job in monitoring and treating their malaria. They told us the community health worker, Willie, was super passionate about their health. And we saw this too. Willie was extremely helpful to us in our endeavors to run this study. But they also reminded us that others in the region aren't so lucky. Therefore, it is our responsibility as scientists to go to villages like Manakamiri and solve problems such as malaria. This coming summer, I will be going to India, to the city of Bombay, to do a larger clinical trial in collaboration with the Technical University there. While in India, I hope to be able to conduct a larger study to show the results in Manakamiri can be replicated at an even bigger scale. In India, we find that malaria is also just as big as a problem as it is in Peru. Actually, I leave for India tomorrow itself, tomorrow afternoon, to begin these clinical trials. But before I leave, I have one request to make from you all. Think of the impact that science and technology have had in your lives, especially in the context of healthcare. From vaccines you received as a young baby to clean drinking water you get growing up, to medications that you have because of ailments when you age, these are necessities in our lives that we take for granted. But these necessities are luxuries for millions of people on our planet. By investing in the disciplines of science and technology, we can ensure that global progress occurs. And we want this progress, again, to occur at a global scale. Drop-based microfluidics is just one example of a technology that can help curb the inequities that exist in healthcare. As just a high school student, I was empowered to create impact. I was empowered to have difficult yet attainable goals. With your investments, there can be many more such empowered individuals, people of any age, who strive to create impact and innovate for our future generations. And by investment, I don't only mean a monetary investment to a cause that could promote global health. Rather, a more valuable investment could be an education in STEM, 
for the students out there, deeply think about pursuing one of these four disciplines, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, for the room for global impact is immeasurable. And for the scientists in the room, we need to work together to make sure that technologies are scalable for everyone. Investing in science and technology is useless if it only helps a few people. Countries like the US, the UK, and France, they have a tendency to make new and complicated technologies. And this is great. These discoveries are great. Don't get me wrong. But it shouldn't be forgotten that much of the world will never be able to have access to this technology. Before creating a new innovation, a scientist should take a minute to think, will this technology that exists here today, that works well here today, does it exist in the rest of the world? Disparities that exist in healthcare are strongly correlated with disparities that exist in economic equity. But remember, despite our diversity, we are all one life. If a malaria treatment works well here today, it is our moral responsibility to make sure people across the globe have access to this treatment. And on a related note, we need to make science and medicine easy to understand. Scientists have this uncanny ability to use scientific jargon and complexity that makes simple concepts just so confusing and alienates many people. For my microfluidics platform to work in countries like Peru and India, Community health workers need to be able to use it. It has to be easy to use for it to be scaled to larger populations. Simplicity leads to scalability. By making technologies that are easy to understand, we can increase user engagement. And as a result, increase the number of people that can get access to these technologies. With your investments, be it in the form of time, money, or education, in simple but scalable technologies, we, as students, scientists, and everyone else in the room can work together to address the problem of inequities that exist in our globe in the context of healthcare. Thank you very much.